So anger. Well, suddenly it seems kind of relevant. Like, <laughs> it was, it's one of my favorite subjects to talk about. I mean, it never goes out of fashion. But, uh, you know, so today of all days, it's, uh, it's, been it's been a pretty angry few days. And so uh, it suddenly seems quite pertinent. And the Stoics um, love anger. Or, you know, they have a kind of love-hate relationship with it. They love, they love talking about anger. They're very interested in it. They're particularly, and it's interesting as a, a cognitive therapist, as a modern day therapist, we, um, it's often said there are kind of three main categories of negative emotion or uh, problem emotions, it's anger, fear, and sadness. And people who are frightened or anxious and, and sad or depressed tend to find their way into therapy more, whereas people who are angry are less likely to, to self-refer because it's an externalizing problem. And when people are angry, they often think that everyone else needs therapy. You guys need the therapy, not me. But one exception to that sometimes is in institutions where, for example, in a school or a prison or sometimes in a relationship, another person might say, you need to do something about your anger, buddy. So there's a little bit of a difference there. We don't, uh, most therapists don't work with quite as much anger as they do depression and anxiety. But the Stoics, for all that they're in interested in doing this kind of ancient proto-therapy, um, they deal with anger first and foremost. And that's kind of appealing to me. You know, we've maybe we've neglected it a little bit. They think it's the big one. Like anger's the one that we need to deal with. And that's just part in a way of their philosophical perspective, their grander vision. You know, I think they think uh, anger is in some respects the more problematically social emotion. Here's some examples I made yesterday. You know, we can see around us the social effects of anger going on in, a, in America right now. And so I think the, the Stoics partly thought, if we take the grander vision, yeah, we need to deal with anger because of the effect that it has on life in general. Um, and there may be other reasons why they thought it was particularly interesting or fundamental. Seneca wrote a whole book entitled On Anger. Other Stoics wrote about anger as well, but his is the only one that we have that survives today in its entirety. So this is like a, a treasure trove uh, in terms of understanding what the Stoics thought about anger. That's our main, main source uh, for understanding the Stoic theory and therapy of anger. But today, I'm going to talk about another Stoic, just to be kind of contrary, be a little bit different. You can go and read Seneca's on anger. Um, I want to talk about Marcus Aurelius and anger, because Marcus Aurelius says a lot about anger as well. Um, and some of you who have read the meditations of Marcus Aurelius might be a little bit puzzled by this, because you might think, Marcus Aurelius isn't Mr. Angry, really. I you know, you, we think of him as being pretty chillaxed. You know, he's not, he's not a particularly angry guy, you might think. And there's a sense in which you'd be right. The, the references that we have to Marx's character in the surviving Roman histories, and just as an aside, people often think the only thing we have is the meditation. That's not true. You know, we have three main Roman histories and then lots of other fragments. It tells a lot about Marx's character and actions and his reign. It seems clear anyway that he was generally perceived as being the opposite of Mr. Angry. Um, he was known for clemency and calm and being a wise and rational ruler, uh, it's like consistently how he's portrayed, um, with one or two small exceptions, notable exceptions. However, I'm going to say something that might be a shocking revelation to some of you, which is that Marcus Aurelius had anger management problems. And you might say, Donald, how can you know that? It's terrible. Now, retrospectively diagnosing somebody from you know nearly 2,000 years away. Well, the thing is, he tells us, right? Um, he may have kept it pretty well hidden, but by nature, Marcus Aurelius was quick-tempered because he says so in the meditations, if you look closely. I, and it's a theme throughout the whole of the book that he keeps returning to, sometimes in an, an amazing, an astounding amount of detail. And I'll come to that later. But I wanted to start off by saying that there's a kind of confession of his own anger management problems. In Meditations 117, at the beginning of the book, um, many people don't notice he thanks the gods that he never lapsed into offending any of his family, friends, or tutors, even though by his character, he said he had a tendency to do so. Um, and it's also known 
that Marcus, it's well known he suffered from chronic stomach and chest pains for most of his life. And he seems to have had problems with insomnia as well. And of course, when people are tired and in pain and have chronic insomnia, chronic health problems, it often makes them more irritable. Um, so Marcus also was surrounded by people trying to manipulate him. And his reign involved one big betrayal after another. So I think it's natural if we bear in mind his physical problems, his insomnia, his chronic pain, and the enormous weight in his shoulders, um, and the, the, the kind of court uh, politics and so on he was surrounded by, it's no surprise that Marcus sometimes struggled not to become angry and, and lose his temper with people. He's, one thing he mentioned struggling with incident is betrayal. No surprise, he was betrayed on a huge scale. Now, more specifically, Marcus also wrote to himself saying that he was often offended by Junius Rusticus, his main Stoic tutor of all people. Like the one guy that he mentions particularly irritating him was his Stoic mentor, who and a guy who's a guy that we also know Marcus loved dearly. You know, he, he li literally idolized him. He built statues of him. He used to go and visit his tomb uh, and pay his respects to him uh, long after he died, we're told. And so Marcus says he thanks the gods that his anger with Rusticus never led him to do anything that he may have regretted. And there's a kind of stoic theme even in these two comments about um, not losing his temper and doing things he might regret. Um, Marcus thinks that anger, may, the Stoics think that, that anger makes us lose sight of the consequences of our actions, whereas the Stoics want to encourage us to think more deliberately, more carefully about the consequences of anger. Um, what was Marcus talking about? What was he tempted to do? Well, powerful Romans lived in a very different world from the one we inhabit today. And we hear many, many graphic stories of the horrific things that they could do when they lost their temples. And Marcus is unlike other Roman nobles and, and emperors, as far as we can tell in that regard. But even you know, during his reign, we have, we have stories about horrendous things. I'm working on the drafts. I've got a pile of drafts here for my graphic novel at the moment. And one of the scenes when we're talking about anger, um, this will be color in the graphic novel. This is a famous story about Octavian, uh, the emperor Augustus, the first Augustus. It's a slave being thrown into a pool full of lampreys, which the, are horrible creatures. And the, the Romans used to breed them, to eat them. They were a delicacy. But uh, one guy, a guy called Vettius Paulo, thought it would be a good idea to feed his slaves to them if they chipped any of his, his precious glasses. So this is a, seems to have been a, a well-known story. Seneca talks about it. I think other classical authors mention it as well. There are some horrendous stories about genuine, real horror stories about things that the Roman aristocrats, or wealthy Romans would do uh, in particular to, to slaves. So when Marcus says, I'm glad I didn't lose my temper and do anything I might have regretted, you know, I don't, I find it hard to imagine that he would have done anything as horrific as that, but he certainly had those kind of examples in mind. And I'll mention briefly an example that would have been even closer to Marcus's mind, which is that of his adoptive grandfather, the Emperor Hadrian, um, who is known for having a, a particularly bad temper. Um, as a young boy, Marcus was raised in and around Hadrian's court, his uh, he was raised by his grandfather after his, his, his natural father, his father died. And uh, Marx's grandfather was a very eminent um, Roman statesman who was friends with Hadrian. Uh, one day Hadrian became so angry with a slave, we're told, and Galen tells us a story, Marx Aurelius' is court physician. He says that Hadrian lost his temper and, and grabbed a, a pen, a metal stylus, which the Romans would dip in ink and use to write with, and he stabbed some bloke in the eye with it in a temper tantrum. And later, after he'd calmed down, Hadrian realized this was a horrific thing to have done. And so the Stoics also incidentally say that the vicious people and foolish people are kind of fickle in their emotions. They, they go back and forth. So Hadrian would do these horrendous things and then feel bad about it afterwards. And so he went back and he apologized. And he said, listen, is there anything that I can do to make, uh, make this up to you? And the man famously said, the punchline is, the guy said, the only thing that I really want is to have my eye back. That was the one thing that even the emperor Hadrian couldn't fix. Like it was gone for good. So the moral of that story is that sometimes when we lose our temper and we act in anger, we cause damage that might actually be permanent and irreparable. So we have to be 
careful about the consequences of anger. And like I say, Marcus never did anything like that, as far as we know. There is a story about him becoming very angry with a Quadai chieftain, um, a chieftain of a Germanic tribe called Ariagasis, who probably uh, instigated a kind of rebellion against Roman rule and really undermined a, a peace treaty that Marcus had been working on for years. Um, and Marcus wanted this guy executed, like assassinated, beheaded, um, but then he backtracked on that and said, look, I'm just going to exile him. It seems to have been Marcus's policy gen generally to exile people that other emperors would have just had beheaded. Um, so Marcus, generally speaking, is cautious. He's got this kind of temper that sometimes he has to work with. Um, he's constantly reminding himself how easy it is for a man in a position of power like him to turn into a monster by losing his temper. Uh, often the amount of harm that we can do uh, when we're angry is limited by our lack of power. But when someone like the emperor becomes angry, someone who can do whatever he likes, we get a glimpse really in a sense of, of, of anger's truly uh, monstrous nature. And uh, we can see how cruel and destructive anger can be when, when nothing uh, really restrains it. Uh, here's a contrasting story. Around 175 AD, towards the, uh, closer towards the end of his life, Marcus was required to preside over a legal battle between the Athenian people and his former Greek rhetoric tutor, a guy called Herodes Atticus. And Herodes was an immensely wealthy man. You can still see the Odeon of Herodes Atticus in, in Athens. He was a famous orator. He was a sophist, but also notorious for his bad temper. When he wasn't getting his way in court, uh, Herodes lost his temper with Marcus and he did something completely unthinkable. In a fit of rage, he launched into a personal attack against the emperor, insulting him to his face. And as his temper spiraled, he lunged forward towards Marcus in a threatening manner. And the Praetorian prefect, the head of the imperial bodyguard, instinctively drew his sword. So this guy was about to die. Uh, Herodes narrowly avoided being cut down where he stood because Marcus swiftly intervened, signaled for his guards to stand down in the nick of time. Marcus then rose from his chair completely unfazed and said only, my good fellow, an old man fears little, before calmly adjourning the meeting and, and leaving the courtroom. And then the following day, Marcus heard the Athenian side of the case and he found in their favour. So he considered the sentence of exile for Herodes, but instead suggested that he leave Athens voluntarily and retire to his villa in Oricum a couple, for a couple of years where he could stay out of trouble. And this is just one very vivid example of a situation in which Marcus keeps his cool in the, faces, in the face of provocation and where his response showed great wisdom and diplomacy. In other words, although Marcus wrote to himself about his inner struggle with anger, in his outer life, he seems to have mastered this emotion. And, and, and then in the meditations, we see this process of mastering his natural inclination towards being uh, quick tempered. So managing angles are a very prominent theme actually in the meditations. It contains many specific pieces of advice for remaining unperturbed by other people. Strategies which Marcus trained himself to follow in his role as emperor. Indeed, we don't have to look very far to find references to coping with anger. In the very first sentence of the very first book of the meditations, Marcus says that he learned from the example of his natural grandfather, Aeneas Verus, to have a kindly disposition and one free from anger. So the meditations opens with a reference to Marcus modeling freedom from anger from his, uh, his father's father. Uh, one of the men who, who brought him up. So perhaps this confirms how important kindness and freedom from anger were to Marcus. He also says as a young boy, still in his mother's household, one of his very first tutors taught him how to turn a deaf ear to slander. And a few years later, when he was aged about 12, Diognetus, the painting master, who was the one who actually introduced Marcus to philosophy, uh, taught Marcus how not to resent plain speaking, how to be uh, so he learned early on how to turn a deaf ear to slander and how to tolerate uh, plain speaking without uh, becoming angry with people. So some key references uh, in the first book of the meditations to, to mark as modeling anger and specific aspects, uh, uh, freedom from anger and specific manifestations of that from key figures in his life. However, Marcus's main role model uh, was undoubtedly uh, his adoptive father, the Emperor Antoninus Pius. 
So writing probably over a decade after his death, Marcus reminds himself to remain a faithful disciple of Antoninus in all areas of life. Well, Antoninus was particularly known for his calm demeanor and his inability to be riled by apparent insults. So in many ways, Antoninus Pius, uh, you can think of him as almost being the opposite of Hadrian. He was Hadrian's successor. He's, very, he's, he's described by Marcus in a way, when I read Marcus's description of Antoninus Pius, uh, I almost imagine after almost every sentence, you could put in brackets, unlike Hadrian. Like, he even says at one point, nobody would dream of calling Antoninus a sophist, unlike Hadrian, who is known for uh, you know, welcoming the sophists and, and the, the second sophistic. So Marcus benefited from having a role model who showed him how to manage his temper and how to deal appropriately with difficult people. So that's our first lesson. It's, a very, it's very valuable to have someone whose example you can follow. Even if you're not lucky enough to be adopted by the most powerful man in the world, you can probably find role models among your friends or acquaintances or in the form of sporting heroes, philosophers, or even fictional characters you admire from books or movies. We need an example of how to respond wisely to provocations. And sometimes it takes an effort to hunt those down, but it's worth doing. Otherwise, how do we know what it is we're trying to achieve? What do we expect to do or say instead of becoming angry? We need something or someone to guide as a role model, whether they're real or imaginary. So we need examples of assertive behavior as opposed to angry behavior that we can we can model. Um, you know, in a sense, in, in Marcus's story makes this clear. Uh, you know, it, it comes back to parenting or upbringing in, in the broad sense is a, a part of this. And Marcus didn't have a father as a role model, but he did have his grandfather. Uh, he had a bad role model in a sense in, in Hadrian, but then later he was inspired um, when he was adopted by Antoninus Pius and he realized how this man's character contrasted dramatically with that of Hadrian. And then his teachers became an inspiration to Marcus, but also Marcus could become a role model and an inspiration to us, um, and, and certainly many people tell me that they really take inspiration from Marcus. He's like a like a virtual father figure to them uh, today. Not to everyone, but to some people. In the Meditations, Marcus discusses the teachings of the Aristotelian philosopher Theophrastus, the main follower of Aristotle, who said that lust is worse than anger. Uh, the man who's moved by anger, he says, seems to turn his back on reason against his will and unwittingly Whereas the person driven by desire for pleasure seems more willing to go along with it, more complicit in his, his own vice. Marcus had an Aristotelian tutor called Claudius Severus, and he must have been familiar with the notable difference of opinion between Aristotelians and Stoics in relation to dealing with anger. The Aristotelians believe that a certain amount of anger or kind of righteous anger can be healthy and natural and sometimes useful. And you hear this every time this discussion comes up on the internet. People say, I think sometimes it's good to be angry. By contrast, the Stoics believed that anger was inherently useless and an unhealthy emotion. It's sometimes said that anger can motivate us, for example. But the Stoics would say that anything anger can do can be done better by reason and by positive emotions, such as natural affection or love and friendship or honor, like love of virtue. For instance, soldiers should be motivated, according to the Stoics, should be motivated to fight wars, not because they hate the enemy, but because they want to defend their loved ones. Be a simple example. Anger biases our thinking in ways that make us bad at solving problems as well. For example, it tends to trick people into underestimating risk. We know this from modern research on cognitive biases and anger. I mean, also, again, think about the protests and the riots and stuff like that, what's going on at the moment in the world, in, in the pandemic, you know, People who are angry, for example, about the pandemic might take risks that lead them to expose themselves or other people to infection because the anger causes them to underestimate risk. Anger tends to lead to black and white thinking, sweeping over generalizations, and jumping to conclusions. The psychologist Hans Eising found that when anger reduced as a result of CBT, um, attitudes of racial and religious prejudice reduced as a result also. So the more angry someone is, the more generalized uh, and prejudiced their thinking will tend to be. And that affects our political views. 
That's another lesson. We don't need anger to motivate us then. Anger clouds our judgment. The wise man puts his trust instead in reason, the Stoics would say. So the Stoics define anger as a judgment that something or someone external is intrinsically bad and must be harmed or even destroyed. So for Stoics, anger is revenge, like it's the desire for revenge. There might be kind of other forms of anger, but basically the paradigmatic form of anger is a desire to hurt or harm another person. It's a desire for revenge. You deserve punch in the nose. Like you deserve to be punished. You deserve to pay for this. It's that kind of way of thinking. Um, incidentally, uh, and this comes up a lot, I love this discussion as well. I've had many discussions over the years about anger, many discussions with soldiers and martial artists over the years about whether ang and boxers, for example, whether anger is helpful in a fight or in a war. One problem is that if anger creates a desire uh, or is synonymous with the desire to hurt the other person, paradoxically, that's not always the best way to win a fight or to win a war. For example, a professional bodyguard might be trained to disarm an attacker, which is potentially very different. Anger drives us to hurt people. Sometimes if you genuinely have to defend yourself or you're involved in a serious conflict, that might not actually be the most effective motivation. Hurting someone isn't the same as winning a fight or winning a war um, or uh, removing a threat. They're two slightly different things and sometimes they can be in conflict. In ancient warfare, the instinctive way to fight was to charge at the enemy screaming and slash at them wildly. That tends to keep them at arm's length, so naturally people kind of go like that. And, and, but it only causes superficial wounds. I mean, it's pretty dangerous, but often in ancient battles there would be many survivors, a lot of people would just run away. Um, a lot of people would be wounded more superficially. And then over time, different tribes or nations learned other ways of fighting that were more lethal. The Romans, in particular excelled at this. They trained their soldiers to resist the natural instincts to charge at the enemy screaming and to remain in formation, get close to the enemy and stab them and kill them more efficiently. The Roman legion was literally a killing machine. Now you need to remain relatively calm to do that. Marcus Aurelius for instance says that soldiers desert their positions and break formation through anger as much as through fear. Socrates discussed this popular definition of courage uh, in part as being like a soldier who stands his ground, remaining in formation in his phalanx in the face of danger, neither running away nor charging wildly into the enemy. So in the Laches, uh, Plato's dialogue about uh, uh, courage and elsewhere, Socrates says courage, you know, one way of understanding it, which he's not entirely convinced by, but it's a recurring metaphor in, in Greek philosophy that remaining at your station, remaining at your post, remaining in formation is, is definitive of anger, uh, de definitive of courage, but anger as much as fear could, could prevent you from doing that properly. Uh, moreover, like Socrates, the Stoics argue that wanting to hurt other people's other people is just irrational, fundamentally irrational, and therefore anger is basically a temporary form of madness best avoided if we want to live wisely. So it's important to realize that the Stoics distinguish between passions that are up to us and based on making faulty value judgments and the reflex like our involuntary feelings that go with them, the propathei. Some feelings we control and others we don't. The Stoics viewed involuntary emotional reactions such as trembling or blushing as indifferent, natural, inevitable and relatively harmless. These are the natural feelings we share with other animals. The real problem occurs when we give our assent to our initial impressions or feelings of anger and allow ourselves to be swept along with them, acting on them, ruminating about perceived offenses and so on. So if someone walks up and spits in your face, it would be natural and inevitable that you would feel a flush of anger, perhaps, or anxiety, depending on the circumstances. Of course, you're going to, some people are going to naturally feel angry. It's going to happen without uh, any thinking in a reflex-like manner. The Stoic theory of emotion recognizes that. And it says that we should not view that as a bad thing. We should view it with studied indifference. The key thing is that we don't then go along with it. We don't act on the basis of that initial reflex-like feeling. So that's really what the Stoics are keen to avoid. So the next lesson, our first lesson was about role modeling. The next lesson is that we must distinguish between what's up to us and what isn't. Some aspects of anger are under our control and others are not. If we tell ourselves, I can't help it, we're lying. Because although there are some aspects we can't control in anger, 
there are other aspects that we are doing voluntarily and we could learn to, to stop. We could take time out from them, as we say in, in anger management therapy. For example, it's now recognized by modern research on cognitive therapy that the amount of time people spend ruminating about problems is largely due to voluntary high level strategic cognitive thought processes. When we spend less time dwelling on revenge fantasies or brooding over perceived off offenses, we become less vulnerable to angry feelings in general. So there's an initial automatic thought, the Stoics called propatheia, and that's viewed by them as indifferent. Uh, it's to be accepted, kind of shrugged off in a sense. And then there's the rumination and the action that falls on from that, which is voluntary. And that's bad because we don't have to do it. Um, it's vicious. So we should learn to go some what something spits in your face, the Stoics would say, accept the initial flush of anger that you feel, like, but then take a time out from it. Like, don't allow that to hijack your thoughts and actions. Like the, the wise man or woman recognizes those feelings happening inside themselves, but they don't allow themselves to be swept along by them. Like they take a step back and exert reason. And in the ancient world, it was well known, the Pythagoreans and the, the Platonists, long before um, the Stoics talk about this idea of uh, taking a time out when they feel anger. And so only punishing somebody if you have to um, in a, a state of calm. That's a assertiveness training today. You know, don't do it in the heat at the moment. Go away. Like, revenge is a dish best served cold kind of thing. You know, go away and calm down first and then decide if there's anything that you actually need to do in response to being assertive rather than being aggressive. Marcus also gives several examples of things he learned from his stoic tutors about coping with difficult people and avoiding anger. We've seen how he said that he struggled not to lose his temper with his stoic mentor, Junius Rusticus. Marcus says it was Rusticus who really made him aware of the fact that he needed moral training for his character and stoic therapy or therapia of the passions, perhaps for his quick temper among other things. Indeed, although Marcus was often angered with Rusticus, it was also, ironically, Rusticus who showed Marcus how to become reconciled with other people after a falling out and how to meet them halfway if they're willing to reconsider their actions. Um, so Rusticus literally did therapy with Marcus, he says so, and uh, he, he, he did therapy with him. And he says uh, that he did something like um, conflict resolution with him. Literally, he says, he showed me how to be reconciled with people um, when they're willing to compromise and uh, you know, make amends. It was Rusticus's job to speak frankly to Marcus and, and make him aware of his flaws. So sometimes that probably irked Marcus, but he learned not to take offense at Rusticus's plain speaking because he gave him permission to say these things. So Marcus trained himself to be tolerant of people criticizing him. He invited criticism. And that's another important lesson. If you get angry when anyone criticizes you, then frankly, you're an idiot. Zeno, the founder of Stoicism, said that we should make everyone our teacher. That means learning to take criticisms on the chin, not being swayed by foolish comments from vicious people, but also not dismissing everything out of hand. The wise man or woman listens to other people, whoever they are, and he learns to discern valid criticisms from unfounded ones. That's very difficult. But it's clearly the way to go. We can't just go through life ignoring what other people say. And we also can't just let ourselves be the victims of other people or let them push all of our buttons. There's a middle path, a via media, that's hard to walk because it requires sorting the wheat from the chaff and other people's opinions and only taking to heart some of them, the ones that actually deserve to be listened to. Now, addition to the, in addition to these points, Marcus provides several fascinating summaries of the techniques he uses for anger management. And one remarkable passage, he lists 10 gifts from Apollo, Apollo, the god of healing, also the god of pandemics, incidentally, the god of plague. Uh, Marcus says that he uses these gifts from Apollo, the god of healing, to help prevent himself from becoming angry with other people. So meditations 11, 18. So most of these 10 anger management strategies recur several times in other passages throughout the meditations. He keeps returning to subsets of them, the selections from the list. But here in 11.18, the whole list is laid out in its entirety, like a, a bullet point list of 10 cognitive strategies for managing anger. Now, I'm astounded by this because I, I ran a training school for therapists for many years in the UK, and I've worked with therapists a lot over the years, and I'm pretty sure if I asked a room full of trainee therapists or experienced therapists off the top of their head to list cognitive strategies for coping with anger, 
I don't know, I haven't tried this, but I'm, I feel confident that they'd name three or four. Maybe collectively they could come up with half a dozen. I'd be surprised if any individual could come up with anywhere near 10, unless it, it was something they, they, they kind of really specialized in. And I, I'd actually be surprised if a room of 20, 30, 40 therapists collectively could come up with 10 distinct cognitive strategies for managing anger um, off the top of their head, uh, it, in all honesty. And yet Marcus is able to list these 10 strategies and he also seems very familiar with them because he keeps referring back to them and using them throughout the meditations. I, I find that quite incredible. Um, so I'm going to go through those 10 strategies with you. Uh, but before I do that, I thought it might be a good time, having spoken of time out, to have a little time out, a little intermission uh, for a couple of minutes and see if anyone has any thoughts or comments. Sure. Sure, uh, Don, there are a bunch of questions. So how, how about this? We take this intermission, we take a bunch of questions and then you can continue. Does that make sense? I'll take questions. I don't want to do it for too long, but maybe five, 10 minutes and then we'll, we'll get into okay. the, the 10. Sounds strategies. good. Sounds good. So uh, it's going to be Hamza and Joe next. Hamza first, go ahead. Uh, when called upon to ask a question, Try to keep your questions brief so we can get to as many right. questions as possible. Uh, just unmute yourself, ask the question, and mute yourself back. Um, go ahead, Hamza. Okay. Hi, Hamza. Hi, Hamza. Can you hear Hi. me? Yeah, can you hear you loud and clear? Hi. Yes, Hamza, go ahead. Hi. Uh, I, I have a question. I, I read your Jordan Peterson uh, article. You said uh, writer's, writer, uh, writer's yeah. anger. Is not uh, uh, is not a science. It's a, pseudo a pseudoscience, and they are mixing uh, anger and assertiveness. So, what's the difference between the two? What what are the boundaries? And thank you. That's, that seemed so to me. Um, I I thought one of the most. I, I for a long time I thought I wasn't really interested in, in Jordan Peterson's work at all. I had to review his book. I was asked to review his book, and I read it twice, cover to cover, and I honestly thought. It, it was a very strange book. It seemed extremely dated to me was the first thing. I was, I was amazed at the lack of reference to modern research in psychopathology or psychotherapy in the book. I don't think he mentions CBT anywhere in the entire book, for instance, but he, he also barely mentions any modern research, paradoxically, although people seem to think of him as representing modern research in clinical psychology as a professor of clinical psychology. What he says about anger um, it's also really odd. It's quite difficult to reconstruct. It took me a lot of effort to kind of extract quotes from him and rebuild what Peterson seemed to be saying about anger. And I, and I kind of got the feeling that, that Peterson expresses a lot of anger in his writings and that some of his followers become quite angry as well. So this is partly why I thought it was an interesting subject. He, he seems to believe in this kind of Aristotelian view of righteous anger. And he, he even, I would go as far as to say he seems to really encourage attitudes of anger. Um, if not aggression in, in some of the passages in his book. And what's glaringly missing from it is, is any reference at all to the cognitive model of anger, which we would use in therapy. So the idea in cognitive therapy um, is that our emotions are shaped to a large extent, if not entirely, by underlying beliefs uh, and by our, our thinking, our cognitions. And that when we identify what those cognitions are, then we open up a whole can of worms, a whole toolbox of therapy techniques because we can evaluate whether the beliefs are true or false, helpful or unhelpful, whether they're contradictory and so on. And Socrates knew this. He had a, a cognitive theory of emotion. So did the Stoics. It's integral to Stoicism. It's the absolute premise of all cognitive therapy. Um, and there's not a hint of that anywhere in Peterson for some strange reason. So often when he talks about anger as being kind of natural and inevitable. He says if a, a man is spurned by a woman, it's natural that he should feel angry and that he should want revenge, as, if I remember rightly, um, is what he says. And that seems odd to me. The Stoics would say immediately, can you think of anyone that doesn't feel that way? Um, and that's their first question. Socrates does that as well. He says other people who don't feel that way about the same situation, I, I would have thought it's glaringly obvious surely everybody has friends that have been spurned by women or vice versa and, and take it like water off a duck's back um, or they move on quickly or they think there's plenty more fish in the sea but they don't see it as a kind of uh, something that justifies 
vengeful feelings of anger or like that might just not occur to, to, to many individuals. And, and that's because of the underlying beliefs, values and attitudes that, that shape our anger. Uh, so it's worth digging those out and, and evaluating them, the, the, the presuppositions that are built into them. So assertiveness, um, the, generally, you know, the idea, first of all, is that assertiveness isn't based on aggressive uh, underlying beliefs, that the desire to, to hurt somebody. Um, but rather, that I would say there are many ways we can distinguish between assertiveness and aggression. But one of them is that the goal of aggression generally is to get revenge or to hurt the other person. Whereas the goal of assertiveness would be to, to, to be reconciled with them. Um, you know, or, or possibly to arrive at some agreement or some anything except hurting them pretty much. It might be to set boundaries. It might be to reconcile differences. Um, there's a whole bunch or cluster of positive outcomes that become the main focus, the main goal when we uh, assert ourselves with another individual. And we can do that quite sternly um, and we might even use threats sometimes in doing it of a sort. Um, we rather consequences. They might say there's consequences if you violate this, this boundary with me. It might be appropriate to do that, but what's driving us isn't the desire simply to hurt the other person, which is what's characteristic of revenge or anger. Okay. Uh, next question is from Joe. Joe, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Robertson. Uh, I appreciate your class and the discussion here today. Um, really quickly, uh, my question is that you mentioned that Marcus had been betrayed, and I imagine that he had two types of uh, feelings in those cases where it could be one would be potentially anger and the other would be disgust. And disgust is a less, much more subtle way of handling a uh, form of aggression. It's not an, in, an immediate action that one, that anger would take. So how does one guard against the subtleties that exist with a reaction of disgust versus anger? That's a tricky one because disgust is an emotional reaction that, that psychologists have kind of struggled to define in some ways, although in certain aspects of it are quite fundamental, basic and simple. Like if you put rotting meat in front of somebody, it's clear that there's a kind of, you know, a, a discernible facial reaction and physio physical reaction that we can call disgust, but it's a little bit harder to kind of um, define uh, cognitively, psychologically, and to distinguish from, from, from other emotions. Um, I think probably most of what the Stoics say about anger potentially relates to disgust. The Stoics don't offer us a, a definition, as far as I'm aware, of, of disgust. Um, so again, you, one problem you're going to have here in talking about what the Stoics say is that one of the things that's hardest to translate from ancient Greek or any language like, into, into English, or from one language into any other quite different language, are, are, are words for emotion. Because um, their map of our emotions just doesn't like, equate to the, the terms that we use in English. And so there might be, there are words that the Greeks use that might be a little bit similar to the English word disgust, um, but there might not be like a, a really close correlation. So you're going to have problems with translation if you look at the Stoic texts and try and kind of derive something. You're going to have to do a bit of generalization, a bit of inference to try and knit those two things together. Um, but I would have said everything they say about anger, pretty much, or most of what they say anger would be potentially relevant to disgust. It might be what you mean by disgust. For example, Seneca might say, simply subsume under anger. He would just say it's, a, it's just one variation of it. It's a, a more brooding, slow burning, kind of ruminative form of anger. Um, but it still contains this underlying value judgment that the Stoics would say is the problem. In a sense, what the Stoics are saying is quite reductionist and it's quite simple. You know, it kind of cuts through all of the confusion. The Stoics say it's a mistake to assign intrinsic value, or a particular type of intrinsic value, to any external event. And when people are angry or they feel disgust, it's of a problematic nature. They think it's the same thing that you'll find every time, which is they're investing more value in the external event than they invest in their own response to it. So the emphasis is wrong. 
and the value that we're assigning, uh, assigning is, is imbalanced is to put it in kind of slightly more te a technical way if you like is what the, sto the stoics are saying uh, they want us to develop apatheia which is this attitude of realizing that nothing external is intrinsically that important. We might prefer that someone doesn't act a certain way, but there's nothing inherently disgusting about their behavior. Like that's a choice, it's a choice that we make to view it that way and someone else might see it differently or 10 years from now looking back on it, we might view it uh, in a different way. The, the values are projected onto the event by us. Uh, let me ask one question. Um, one of the things that I've looked at is uh, Jack Banksep's work on kind of neuropsychology, and he identifies these uh, seven different uh, circuits, emotional circuits, and anger is one of them. So one characteristic he notices of anger in mammals is that it always looks for a target. So that, that is the thing that is hurting me. So there is a phenomena of scapegoating like yeah so immediately you can't really be angry without having a target i'm and gonna i'm gonna there's a whole, a whole kind of worms there and actually it's not one of the things i was going to focus on but there's there are cognitive and attentional biases associated with anger that make it deeply problematic the stoics have a much simpler way of putting that they say anger is temporary madness and that cuts that covers many evils right and they're right like anger consists of all sorts of crazy cognitive and attentional biases which might have served the function in evolutionary terms in certain contexts but when we indulge in them when we ruminate about them when we allow them to dominate our actions now it, it's it's inherently irrational um in strong emotions generally we tend to be guilty of selective thinking also of making over generalizations. Um, Hans Eisenk, for example, found that uh, anti-Semitism and uh, racism were correlated with anger. And actually when the anger reduced, then those uh, political, racial, religious prejudices uh, reduced as a consequence. So we know that people who are angry tend to underestimate risk. They tend to be bad at problem solving. Like, the Stoics were basically right in a nutshell when they said it's temporary madness. Um, Socrates said in Plato's Republic, when somebody becomes really upset about a problem, they allow themselves to indulge in doing uh, something that prevents the thing that's most required in the face of misfortune, which is to think calmly and clearly and solve the problem. And he was uh, worry and grief and excessive anger. Socrates thought, it's as simple as that. Like all of these things prevent you from thinking clearly in a way that mm -hmm. would allow you to solve a problem. And particularly with interpersonal problems like we see in the political arena and on social media at the moment, like human relationship society is, is the most complicated thing that we have to deal with, right? It uh, blows our minds. Like, so people are complicated. And, you know, you sure as hell, like the one thing that you really need if you're going to have to deal with politics and deal with society is a clear head and an ability to tolerate uncertainty, ambiguity and complexity. If you're angry, boom, that goes out of the window uh -huh. and everything suddenly becomes massively oversimplified and black and white. So anger is inherently toxic when it comes to dealing with subtle, nuanced social uh, problems. Excellent. Uh, so, Don, would you like to take uh, one or two more questions, or would you like to proceed with the presentation? Well, I think let's continue, and then we, we can, you know, we can deal with a bunch Sounds of questions good. at the end. Sounds cool. Good. Okay, so let's look at these ten gifts from Apollo. So, I'll preface it by saying, you could distinguish between. I love classifying things, and there are. You can think of psychological techniques as being visual, verbal, cognitive. Um, physical, you know, affect, you know, whatever. There's different ways of categorizing them. But basically, you know, many techniques can be divided into cognitive and behavioral. So the Stoics have behavioral techniques for managing anger. Epictetus talks about them. For instance, this idea of taking a time out. So literally walking away like, and, and coming back to the, the situation later, once you've calmed down as a kind of behavioral, more... Um, Kind of physiological like more visceral way of dealing with things and interesting marcus doesn't really talk about the and at least in this passage and generally in the meditations he, he doesn't talk so much about these more behavioral um 
in terms more of the, the, your physical actions uh, in dealing with anger. He, he's here, he's literally listing just cognitive strategies for coping with anger. Um, I would also call them perspective shifting techniques, different ways of looking at anger. Now, the first one he mentions um, is his favorite one. How do I know it's his favorite one? Because if I pull together all of the passages where he provides a selection, uh, so usually he'll name like three or four of these strategies in different parts of the meditations. This is the one he mentions most often. And it's the one, to cut a long story short, that he makes most prominent. And, and so therefore, perhaps it's no coincidence that it's the first one on this list. Um, but it's also the one that I find modern readers have the most problems with. And it's also one that has the kind of most storied history, if you like, in terms of Greek philosophy. So it's, there's a lot I could say about it, but I won't dwell on it too much because I know it is one that most people tend to pass over. They're not as keen on it. So his first gift from Apollo is to say to himself that we should look on ourselves as inherently social creatures. So Stoics believe that we're inherently rational and social in nature. These are the two wings of Stoicism. They're integral to the Stoic understanding of human nature. We're both rational and social in our very nature. We're designed, in other words, to live in communities and help one another. We're designed by nature, by Zeus, um, to live in harmony, to find ways to work with one another. Many people would say, well, I believe that instinctively we're designed for conflict. Um, the Stoics, when they talk about nature, are talking about our natural potential, our telos. They say we've been constructed by nature with everything that we need to achieve harmony. And, it, and they said it looks like we're working towards that. We develop language, we develop communities, we develop laws. They thought the achievement of law in society was one of the kind of crowning achievements of civilization. And it was emblematic of this idea that human nature has this inherent potential to work towards harmony and to become unified. So this is very important to Marcus because of his role as emperor. And what he actually says is, recall your relationship towards mankind and that we come into being for the sake of one another. And that from another point of view, I, as emperor, he says, have come into it to be set over men as a ram over a flock or a bull over a herd with a kind of parental responsibility for them because of his, his station in life. But more fundamentally, you know, we have an obligation, he thinks, to live in harmony. So by focusing his attention on this idea that we've got a duty to help one another um, and that he has a special duty in this regard because of his power as emperor, Marcus was able to moderate his feelings of anger and frustration with other people. So sometimes someone betrayed him or offended him, he would remind himself that nature has given him all of this capacity to overcome conflict, to be reconciled with people. And he thinks this is an implicit goal in human nature. This resembles the opening passage of Meditations Book 2, where Marcus describes mentally preparing himself each morning to deal with troublesome people, adding, nor can I be angry with my kinsman, nor hate him, for we have come into being for cooperation. And he says, to obstruct one another is against nature. And we do obstruct one another by showing resentment or turning our back on others. Elsewhere, Marcus goes so far as to say that ignoring our fellowship with others is injustice, a vice, and also a form of impiety because it goes so deeply against nature. The soul wrongs itself, he says, when it turns away from anyone or opposes them with intent to do them harm, as is the case in anger. So the stoic goal of living in harmony with the rest of mankind doesn't mean that we should expect them to act like our friends. On the contrary, we should be prepared to meet many foolish and vicious people in life, but to accept that is inevitable. The stoic tries to view ordinary people in the same way in everyday life when they seem to oppose him or present problems. In fact, in a sense, he needs these challenges so that he can have an opportunity to grow in virtue and become more resilient. If nobody ever did anything that had the potential to test our patience, then we'd lack an opportunity to exhibit virtue in our relationships. The Stoic idea is fundamentally that human nature is both rational and social, therefore. We therefore fulfill our natural potential and we flourish as human beings by learning to live harmoniously with others and treating them with wisdom, justice, kindness and fairness, even foolish and vicious people. So many people have seen this aspect of Stoicism as an obvious precursor of early Christian ethics, for instance.
And it's, a, it's all the way through the meditations in particular. Marcus certainly more, places more emphasis on it than Epictetus does. The Seneca uh, also places quite a lot of uh, emphasis on, on this idea. Um, this is a bit of a digression, but there's a very famous speech by oh, one of the sophists. It's either Protagoras or Prodicus. I think it's Prodicus. It's called The Great Discourse. And it, it, if you really are interested in this subject, it, this is the um, locus classicus, like uh, this famous speech. And it's a kind of weird mythological story. Like you have to view it as an allegory, right? It explains why the Greek philosophers were so enamored of this idea that humans have that, an obligation to form communities and to have laws and to bond together. They think it's uh, something that's intrinsically natural and that we, we're, we have a duty to ourselves and others to do this. But the, the great discourse of Prodicus, uh, or maybe Prasagoras, I'm testing my memory now, is, uh, uh, you know, I can just look it up, can I? Is a, a, the main source. It's almost like Marcus in these little, uh, remarks is alluding to this much uh, longer speech. Oh, it's Protagoras, right, the kind of precursor of Protagoras. There you go. Okay, so number two on the list. When someone's making us angry, we should consider their character as a whole. And this is a kind of very typical Stoic thing that they think we narrow our focus of attention. So Marcus actually says we should think what sort of men they are at their dinner tables, in their beds, and elsewhere. Above all, how they're compelled by their own opinions and how they delude themselves about what they're doing. So we should really try and put ourselves in other people's shoes. We should empathize with them and have a more nuanced, more complex, more complete, and more rounded understanding of the other person. And he thinks that's inherently a way of overcoming anger. Now that resonates with me very deeply because of my profession as a psychotherapist and a former counselor. I was a schools counselor for many years. So counselors and therapists have to empathize with their clients. And sometimes I used to work with young people, for instance, that were uh, on probation and, and you know, maybe had committed terrible crimes. And, uh, you know, people that in a way it would be easy to rush to judgment about. But if your job is to sit in a room with someone for hours and hours and talk to them about what's going on in their head and about their personal history, um, I think it does naturally tend to dilute the feelings of anger and resentment that you have towards them because you realize that people's behavior is multifactorial. Like people do things, they do the things they do for a bunch of different reasons. There are a whole bunch of factors that come together. And when we're angry, we want to distill it down to a single reason and just blame them. Like it all just is voluntary, it just comes from them, rather than thinking it's a combination of voluntary stuff and ignorance and external influences and depression and drugs and all kind of coming together. We can't handle that complexity when we're angry. But the more rounded and complete and complex our vision is, the harder it is for us to have this kind of monolithic feeling that anger wants to be. At the very least, you know, our, our feelings become more. Uh, complex and, and nuanced. So Marcus tells himself that he should broaden his perspective and think not only of the actions that offend him, but of the other person as a whole, remembering that nobody is perfect. This broadening of perspective is likely to dilute the anger, as I said. Uh, we humanize other people in this way and we learn to empathize. We can also see others as the victims of their own misguided beliefs or er errors of judgment rather than just as simply malicious, just bad people. That can make it easier for us to forgive them while nevertheless disagreeing with them or opposing their actions. So as a, th a therapist, you, you have to rem remain objective and uh, sometimes prevent people from doing things that would be dangerous to themselves or other people, uh, challenge certain destructive behaviors, but at the same time kind of understand where they're coming from. And also as a parent, you know, I mean, maybe a better example, more familiar example to many people would be if one of their children goes off the rails or, or actually all children at some point will do things that are naughty or, or even pretty vicious. You know, kids do, can do shockingly nasty things. 
Um, but a, a good parent, you know, just horrified by that and kind of, uh, you know, overly punitive about it. But you try and understand where it's coming from. You know, you, you have to understand in order to be able to, to interact with people and change their behavior. So Marcus says we should put ourselves in the shoes of others and analyze their character by asking ourselves what kind of people they are, what kind of people they want to please, and for what purpose and through what kind of acts, what their guiding principles are in life, what do they spend their time doing, uh, we should try and imagine the souls laid bare before us, he says, with all their errors, until it seems absurd that anyone could imagine blame or praise from them could ever do us any harm or good. So he also thinks this is a way of gaining distance or detachment from their attitudes and, you know, not being kind of brainwashed by other people's opinions or swayed too easily by either praise or censure coming from others. The wise man, he says, learns to receive the approval or disapproval of others with relative indifference. Marcus says, especially when it comes from the sort of men who cannot even win their own approval. This is one of his favorite things to say. He says, why should I care about the approval of somebody who doesn't even approve of themselves? So number three, and this is the most controversial one on his list, but it's also m the most familiar one to many academic philosophers. Nobody does wrong willingly or knowingly. And this is clearly a reference to Socrates. It's a famous paradox of Socrates. So Marcus says, uh, remember that if they're doing the right thing here, then there's no need for us to be annoyed. If it's not the right thing, then it's clearly involuntary and through ignorance because it's against its will that every mind is deprived of the truth. And likewise of the power of dealing virtuously with each man according to his worth. In any case, such men resent being called cowardly, greedy, uh, for greedy for reputation and dishonorable and being accused of wrongdoing by their neighbors. So he makes the obvious observation that when you tell people they're greedy, vicious or unjust, like most people will naturally be quite offended by that because they believe that what they're doing is right. That's obvious in the political arena. Um, and it just goes around and around in circles, doesn't it? So nobody wants to believe that they're in the wrong. Uh, the Socratic notion that no rational being wishes to be deprived of the truth. Humans are by nature thinking beings, homo sapiens. However, to think at all is to wish to get things right. Nobody really thinks in order to be mistaken. Nobody wants to be wrong, especially when it comes to the most important things in life. For the Stoics, this means that our very nature commits us to valuing truth and wisdom, at least in principle, if not in practice. However, if we grasp that fundamental principle, then it follows that whenever someone errs, they do so unwillingly. So, when someone offends us, we should first ask if what they're saying or doing is actually correct. If it's correct, then really accepting that fact should dissipate much of our anger. However, if they're mistaken, then we have more reason to pity them than to feel anger. It's obvious that when people do wrong, they typically defend themselves as if they're in the right because it actually seems right to them, however wrong it seems to us. Again, paying attention to the fact that they believe they're doing the right thing and are making an error of moral judgment helps us to be more forgiving, as if a child had done something wrong without realizing it. Epictetus tells his students very simply to say, literally say the words, it seemed right to him, when they notice they're becoming angry or frustrated with another person's objectionable nature. So Epictetus is very Socratic. And that's it. him literally, you get a bullet point version of Socrates from Epictetus. He says to his students, literally tell yourself it seemed right to him. The condensation of much more nuanced discussion in the Socratic dialogues. As Marcus puts it, what proceeds from men deserves our love insofar as they're our kin. However, at times it also deserves our compassion insofar as they're ignorant of good and evil, morally blind, a disability more severe than physical blindness. In short, the Stoics believe that it's inconsistent of us to blame people who are morally misguided while forgiving people who act as they do because of fever or insanity. Foolishness, they think, is a disease, a form of madness. Nobody wants to be foolish and wrong. And so we should feel compassion towards people who seem ignorant about the true nature of good and evil. So nobody does evil willingly uh, is his third strategy. He reminds himself to think that way. Um, Number four, nobody is perfect, yourself included. So he actually says, remind yourself that you too do many bad things and are much like others. If you do refrain from certain wrongdoings, nevertheless, you have the potential, but you're inclined that way, even if through cowardice or greed for reputation or some other such dishonorable consideration, 
you don't actually commit them. So we might say the only thing that prevents us from doing horrendous things is that we don't have the, the power that Hadrian and other emperors do. And that's partly why Marcus originally said he was frightened of becoming emperor. He didn't want that much power. Until I think the example of Antoninus Pius reassured him that somebody could live at court and have that much power and handle it responsibly. We've already noted that Marcus acknowledged his own character flaws, such as his temper. There are no gurus in Stoicism. They believe we're all foolish, vicious, and enslaved to our passions to some extent, except for the perfect sage, the Sophos, and he's an ideal like the utopian society. It would be hubris to deceive yourself into thinking you're above wrongdoing, says Marcus. We're all fallible. By bearing that in mind, we're likely to be more forgiving and less angry towards the wrongdoing of others. In fact, the very anger we feel towards those who offend us could itself be seen as evidence of our fallibility, showing that we're also capable of doing the wrong thing ourselves if guided by strong emotion. So ironically, as soon as we notice we're getting angry, that should cause us to recognize our imperfection, our fallibility. And then we're on the same uh, ground as the person that we're getting angry with. The more we pay attention to our own imperfection, the harder it is to feel as angry um, with other people's imperfections, he's saying. Focusing on our own imperfections and the fact that fallibility is inevitable, the common lot of mankind can therefore help to diminish feelings of anger. So uh, number five, remember that you can never be certain of other people's motives. So Marcus says, remember that you have not even grasped with certainty that they are doing wrong for many things are done out of expediency. Generally speaking, a man must learn many things before he can deliver a firm moral, uh, firm opinion regarding the actions of others. So anger assumes an unwarranted certainty about the motives of other people. It involves mind reading, as we call it, in cognitive therapy. We can grasp some ideas with a reasonable degree of certainty, but most things in life have to be judged on the basis of probability, particularly our interpretation of what other people are thinking or what their motives are. We often behave as if we know other people's motives for certain, but in reality, we're just guessing what they're thinking. We're making an educated guess. If we bear in mind sufficiently that we're just speculating about the motives of other people and that other plausible interpretations exist, that should introduce cognitive flexibility and weaken the strength of angry feelings. We should remind ourselves that we can never be certain what's going on in someone else's mind and consider the range of interpretations in a way that broadens the scope and flexibility of our thinking. So that also tends to dilute angry feelings. And I should mention that a big part of the emperor's role, particularly Marcus, uh, studied law uh, and uh, functioned in Roman society also as a kind of magistrate. So he, he literally had to sit in court and preside over cases and also was involved in diplomacy. So on a, a, huge, a, a hugely important level, Marcus was responsible for trying to figure out what other people were thinking and what their motives were. Foreign uh, kings, for example. And so here we have him it's very, when you're reading the meditations, part of the perennial appeal of the meditations is that there's something odd about the way that it's written. It seems very homely. It's surprisingly easy to remove it from its historical context because Marcus says frustratingly little in the text of the meditations, apart from in book one, he names a bunch of people. But elsewhere, he says surprisingly little about uh, the events of his reign. Uh, and so he talks about being, for, you know, dealing with betrayal. And we think, oh, yeah, I deal with betrayal. Yeah, like, you know, my ex-girlfriend or something like that. He's talking about world history. He's talking about civil war. Like, world historic, like, betrayals. The Markomannic invasion was, they broke a peace treaty. It was a huge conspiracy and betrayal. So we lose sight of the vastness of the implications, the weight on this guy's shoulders because of the kind of homely way that he talks about these things. Um, and, you know, again, being certain of what other people are thinking, it sounds like he's just talking about his, you know, spouse or something like that, or one of his kids, uh, you know, when in far, part, part he's talking about um, dealing um, with peace treaties with, with foreign kings of these implications for the history of the uh, world historic events. 
Number six, remember we'll all die. I find, like, people tell me they find this surprisingly helpful when they're angry with somebody. So he says, when you're extremely annoyed or find someone insufferable, remind yourself that human life is momentary and in a short while, we'll all be stretched out dead. Sometimes I think that does help to prevent us from placing too much importance. We tend to, the people that we hate and are angry with, in a sense, we put on a pedestal and we often place too much value on their opinions. Nothing lasts forever. Focusing on the transience of material things is a very basic common stoic strategy for weakening strong emotions by reducing our attachment to externals. This moment will soon pass and things will inevitably change. The person who offends us will change and eventually they'll die. And then one day, even their memory will be forgotten. So in the, if in the future, looking back, this will seem trivial, then why should we care strongly about it now? Marcus implies that this is part of viewing someone's character as a whole and objectively. We're bound then to consider their opinions as transient, as part of a life that is itself fleeting. Our anger naturally diminishes when we see the other person's life's, life and actions and their opinions as a as of a brief span in the grand scheme of things. So remember that one day you'll be dead. So is it worth really kind of getting uh, this angry about things? Remember one day they'll be dead, but also the argument that you're having, you know, 10 years from now, you probably won't even be able to remember it. So think about the transience of things. Think about the bigger picture, you know, think about a hundred years from now, no one's going to care about this argument that you're having. Um, even if you're a Roman emperor, you know, like a lot of the things that were, really important during his reign are completely forgotten now. Uh, so they may still have significance, they may still have importance in the moment, but maybe not be all important in the way that things seem when we get really irate about them. Number seven, remember that it's our own judgments that harm us. Uh, he says, that remember that in reality, it's not the acts men do that annoy us, because those belong to their domain, the domain of their own ruling faculty, but the opinions that we form of those acts. Eliminate these. Be ready to discard your conclusion that the act in question is a catastrophe and your anger will come to an end. How can you eradicate these opinions? By realizing that no act of another person can bring us into dishonor, because uh, unless only that which is dishonorable is considered an evil, you will necessarily do many wrong things yourself and become a crook or whatever other sort of man you're worried about. This is Epictetus's most famous quote, the most famous quote in Stoicism that Marx is referring to here. We're offended by things when we view them as harmful, but Stoicism teaches us that other people can't harm our character and our character is the most important thing in life. Indeed, that's ultimately the only important thing in life to the Stoics. If we're too attached to external things and forget about maintaining our own character in accord with the virtues, then we risk becoming vicious. On the other hand, if we firmly grasp the truth that other people's actions can't harm our character, then our anger towards them should be eliminated. Elsewhere, Marcus says that if we eliminate the opinion, I am harmed, the feelings of being harmed will at once disappear. And when the feeling is gone, so is the harm. It's part of our nature as social beings to care about other people. And social virtues like justice, fairness, and kindness consist in wishing to benefit others, seeking for them to flourish, fate permitting. However, insofar as they're external to us and beyond our direct control, their thoughts and actions cannot directly impinge on our own good or bad. Marcus sometimes advises himself to listen carefully to others, as we've seen, but at other times he also reminds himself not to pay too much heed to the opinions of others, but to cherish his own character first and foremost. So this is just an extension of that doctrine or a specific application of that doctrine. It's not things that upset us, but our opinions about them. Number eight. Um, sorry, number seven. Um, it's not other people's actions that make us angry, but rather our opinions about them. And then number eight, anger does us more harm than good, is also a specific manifestation of a very general stoic principle that often is closely associated with this famous quote from Epictetus. So it's not things that upset us, but our opinions about them and our getting upset does us more harm than the thing that we're upset about would be the very, the, this, this coupling of two Stoic doctrines that are very fundamental and often found together. Uh, Marcus says, remember how much harder it is to bear the consequences of our anger and suffering in response to the actions of others than it is the very acts provoking the anger and suffering. So the consequences of our own anger are often worse 
than the, the thing that we're angry about. But the Stoics would go even deeper than that. Anger may make us do bad things like Hadrian stabbing that slave. And then, you know, that becomes a bigger problem than the offhand remark that the slave made that, that upset him. But also Marcus thinks at a deeper, more philosophical level, anger is more harmful than the things we're angry about because it damages our very character. We take offence because we assume other people's actions damage our interests in some way, but if we remember that our own anger does us even more harm because it damages our very character, then we weaken its grip on us. The Stoics say the fear of death is more dangerous to us than death itself because it harms our moral character, because death is merely a fact of nature. So in the same way, anger about perceived slights does us more harm than the slights themselves, because the actions of others are external to us and cannot touch our character. But our own anger does penetrate into our character itself. Does a man do wrong? The wrong rests with him, says Marcus. And he likes to repeat this over and over again. We should be much more concerned, therefore, to eliminate our own anger, which is up to us than to try to eliminate the thing we're angry about, which is beyond our direct control. So number nine, the penultimate gift from Apollo. Nature gave us the virtue of kindness. This is also a manifestation of a very basic generic Stoic strategy, which is to ask ourselves what virtue nature has given us to respond to a particular problem. So Marcus here answers that question. He says, nature gave us the virtue of kindness. He says that kindness is irresistible as long as it's sincere and no fake smile or mask is assumed. Because what can the most unscrupulous of men do to you if you persist in being kind to him? And when a chance is given, gently encourage him in the right direction. And at the very time when he's trying to do you harm, quietly teach him a better way as follows. Say, no, my son, we've been made for other things. I shall be in no way harmed, but you're harming yourself. So side note, he there shows us specifically an example of how he would respond to someone that's angry with him. And curiously, what he says is an amalgam of two of the preceding strategies. So he says, no, my son, we've made, we have been made for other things. That's strategy number one, like we're social by nature. Nature, Zeus has created us to live in harmony, not to fight. Number one. Number two, I shall be in no way harmed. You're merely harming yourself. That is strategy number eight. Anger does us more harm than good. So Marcus continues this uh, passage saying, show him delicately and without any personal, personal criticism that this is so. And that even honeybees do not act in this way, nor any creatures with communal instincts. So again, it's this natural uh, instinct that we have. However, you must do this without irony or in the manner of a rebuke, but with affectionate kindness and without any bitterness in your heart, not as from a schoolmaster's chair, nor to impress bystanders either, but as if you were alone, even though others might be present. This is where Stoicism contrasts with cynicism. The Stoics believe in paresia or honesty and plain speaking, challenging and confronting people, but they also believe it has to be done tactfully diplomatically in order to be effective. We need to empathize with the other pe person, understand their point of view in order to be able to speak plainly with them in an effective manner. Kindness is a stoic virtue, subordinate to the cardinal virtue of the kaiosune, or justice. It consists in wishing other people well, fate permitting. In other words, wanting them to become wise and good themselves, while accepting that this is not under your direct control. So notice in this quote that Marcus talks about educating the other person with regard to these strategies that he's covered earlier in the list. Um, he, elsewhere, by the way, Marcus wrote that correcting someone else's vices is like pointing out that they have bad breath. It requires tact and diplomacy. So that's a nice way of putting it. Marcus intended his advice about showing kindness to be, as I've said, a specific application of this more general purpose stoic remedy, which consists in asking himself what virtues capabilities nature has given him that would allow him to, to adapt to the situation and respond rationally. So the virtues are seen as antidotes or remedies for the disease of anger. However, stoic virtue consists in seeking to educate and improve others where appropriate, while simultaneously accepting that the character is beyond our direct control. So number 10, we've reached the last, the ultimate uh, piece of advice that he has. He says, it's madness to expect others to be perfect. This is kind of bound up with Stoic determinism and objectivity. 
He says, remember then these nine headings, taking them as gifts from the muses, and begin at last to be a man while you have life. However, beware of flattering men, no less than of being angry with them, because both of these are antisocial and cause harm. So I kind of like finding this uh, uh, alternative, this via media, so neither being cowardly nor aggressive. When tempted to anger, he says, this is a precept to have ready to hand. To be angry is not manly, but rather a mild and gentle disposition is more manly because it's more human. Such a man, and not one who gives way to anger and frustration, is endowed with strength and nerves of steel and manly courage, because the nearer such a mind comes to freedom from irrational passions, or apatheia, the nearer is the man to strength. Just as the passion of grief is a weakness, so also is anger. In either case, it's an injury and a surrender. Elsewhere, again, he says, as I mentioned earlier, he says soldiers like abandon their, their position in the phalanx as much through cowardice, anger as through cowardice. However, take this, if you will, as a tenth gift from Apollo, the leader of the muses, the god of therapy. To expect bad people not to do bad things is madness, because that is wishing the impossible. This is a recurring theme in Stoicism. You know, don't wish for figs in winter. There are good and bad people in the world. There are wise and foolish people in the world. You know, there's all manner of people in the world. We know this, so why should we be surprised? And then he goes on to say, however, to accept their wrongdoing towards others, while expecting them to refrain from wronging you, would be hard-hearted and tyrannical. Like to, in other words, to sit back and watch people treating others with injustice would be hypocritical of him, rather than intervening and doing something about it, part of his responsibility as emperor. So this last point, um, I think, is is important. Um, I just want to say that, again, a very, a very simple observation is when you're a therapist and you work with, you know, thousands of people and you sit in your little consulting room together, just the two of you, over and over again, you'll notice that when people are really upset, they, they, they you know, one of the things that we do that, that people don't think is strange, we're complacent about, is this disavow this um, avowal of surprise. So people, when they're upset, will go, I can't believe this is happening. How could she do that? Why would someone do that? This can't be real. And when people are really upset, they say that. Now, that's crazy talk, right? Because from an outside perspective, like the the things that people say are unbelievable, shocking. How could this even be possible? The things that they avow shock and surprise in response to are invariably things that happen, may albeit in a different form, to loads of other people. Like human life is, you know, there are typical things that happen. Everyone gets, you know, people uh, all around the world get dumped by their girlfriends and boyfriends, jolted at the altar, get their wallet stolen, you know, and yet when it happens to us, we think, I can't believe this is happening. Even though the Stoics would say a rational, a wise, a philosophical person would say, c'est la vie, these things happen in life. When I see it happening to other people, I think, you know, that's hard luck, but these things happen sometimes. I can't believe my flat got burgled. Flats get burgled every day. I used to um, give the example that when I worked in central London, I'd walk past pickpockets every day. And I had my wallet or phone stolen maybe two or three times over the space of like 10 years or something. And when it happened, I said to myself, I knew this would happen eventually. Like, no matter how careful I am, eventually I'm going to kind of forget or something. I, you know, to be, keep my eye on my stuff and it's going to get stolen. Because there are, I know there are pickpockets all over the place. Um, I see them, uh, you know, like every day at the time, I did anyway. So this, one of the fundamental strategies of Stoicism is they think that viewing life rationally requires, an, in a very obvious way, getting rid of this kind of feigned surprise that for some reason is kind of endemic in strong emotions. It's just crazy when you think about it. Like, it doesn't make any sense. You're lying when you say to yourself, I can't believe this is happening. Why? Like, because at some level, you knew it was possible. And this, so the Stoics think, look, a, a calm, a rational, a philosophical response would be the opposite of that. It, it, if anything, it would have said, it would say, I should have seen this coming. Like, because I know already that these things happen in life. And as always, their kind of ultimate example of that is death. So the kind of shock and surprise that people have towards death. We all know that you could die any minute. 
like you know and the stoics talk a lot about the thing that we most have most evidence about from personal experience in life is that everybody dies and yet we kind of blot it from our minds and we act it we try and deny that it's going to happen at some level we act as if we're immortal Marcus says you keep acting as if you're going to live for 3,000 years you know you need to get it in your head that you could die any minute like the pandemic is a good example of that I can't believe this is happening but at another level like pandemics happen like you know they happen all the way through history and the experts have been telling us for ages that another one was bound to happen eventually because of uh, uh, international travel so the stoic response to that would be i should have seen this coming we should be prepared in advance for these kind of things so those are the, the 10 uh from a poll uh, and with that i shall conclude uh, and hand back over again to shukant Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, uh, Rosalie, I'm going to mute you. Um, okay, so this is great. Um, thank you very much. And now we go to questions. So questions, um, we've got four rules that we have used to make possible really, uh, you know, very energetic exchange. Rule number one, raise your hand when you want to speak. The way you raise your hand is you can type a question or type exclamation mark in the chat or raise your hand in Zoom. Rule number two, keep on topic. We're talking about anger and stoicism. Rule number three, be brief. We want to get to as many questions as possible. And rule number four, be courteous. Feel free to be open and uh, you know, very candid about what you think. Feel free to disagree with anything that is said, but do so courteously. Okay, those are the four rules. All right, so with that, um, it's going to be Yen Lee, then uh, Dan, then Sashay, Zeno, Mike, Vincent, Roger, and Fatih next. Yen, go ahead. Uh, Yen Lee, go ahead and uh, when called upon to ask a question, just unmute yourself, ask the question, and then um, mute yourself. Yen Lee, are you there? Okay, we'll go to the next one. Uh, Dan, Dan, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, Yen Lee and I were actually talking about uh, great stoic characters in fiction. Uh, she pointed out that James Bond, at least the earlier James Bond as I remember it, seldom got angry at his uh, villains and he always kept his cool. Can you think about uh, or can you tell us what your favorite characters from fiction might be who are very stoic? And by the way, this is, this is a question not just for trivia, it's a good teaching tool. You know, the short answer to that is probably I know because I'll tell you something. Uh, I, I love a bit of a personal peculiarity is that I don't read fiction, um, but I do watch movies. So I should probably be able to come up with an example from my movie, but I never seem to be able to think of good stoic role models from fiction. I can think of individual, what was that film about? Uh, there was a, there's a film now that I can think of that's quite a good example, but I've forgotten the name of it. Um, James Bond, I'm not really sure. I don't know James Bond well enough to comment on that. Um, the favorite fictional example, as it were, of the ancient Stoics, incidentally, was Heracles. But their perception of him as a character, a mythological character, is very different from ours. They see him more as a, a kind of enlightened figure. And, and we view him, we have a bit of a different perception of the story of Hercules. Um, I'm not sure. I know. I'm. I, I'm not really into fiction enough to be, uh, to be able to give a good example th uh, in response to that. Unfortunately, um, and one thing I'd say also is fictional characters. Or okay, the, let's take the thing, next I'll, question. I'll, I'll, I'll answer it in a kind of a roundabout way by saying. Oh, I was just going to add that the Stoics are very interested in fiction, but they usually think of. Um, the fiction of their time, the Greek tragedies, is providing bad examples as uh, kind of case studies in psychopathology. So their their interest is more in what we can learn from fiction about how not to cope. But uh, I, yeah, I can't really think off the top of my head of any good fictional examples that maybe if if one comes to me later, I'll mention it.
Okay, thank you. Uh, various people have typed in all kinds of examples, so you guys can have a look in the chat. Uh, next question is from Sashi. Sashi, go ahead. Sashi? You need to unmute yourself. Okay, next up is uh, Zeno. Zeno, go ahead. Hello there. Hello there. Thank you for. Uh, okay, Sashi. Uh, very, very I, we can hear you. Go ahead. Um, I just did. Uh, Sashi? Yeah, thank you. Just beautiful. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for a very, very interesting lecture. Thank you very much. But I, sorry, I need to, um, all these scenarios that you talked about, about anger is, uh, it's due to uh, um, uh, external stimulus, you know, stimuli. You, you have to be stimulated by a, a, another person in order to feel anger, first of all. So I, want to just clarify if anger that you are talking about is internal or external? Uh, thank you, Sashi. In terms go, ahead. Of, um, uh, go ahead, Don. It's, it's target or reference. So do you mean whether it's about uh, John, can you hear me? things or about Please go ahead. things? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Sashi's okay, yeah. bandwidth is very oh. low. Yeah, can you, can you hear me? Am I muted? Uh, John, uh, Sashi's bandwidth is very, uh, Sashi's bandwidth is very poor, so she won't be able okay. to respond. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure I fully understood uh, the question yeah. whether it is it's asking. Can I think, you, I think okay. it's asking. Uh, let's do one thing. Uh, Sashi uh, cannot, her bandwidth is very low. So okay. uh, I, you can I think the question is asking whether. Um... Okay, um, let, let's. I just say that in terms of the, the focus of anger, you can be angry with other people, um, but you can also obviously okay. be angry with yourself. Can you hear me now? Uh, Don, just go ahead to the next one because uh, there are all kinds of... To a large extent, although they don't talk explicitly about this a lot, a large, I could think you could approach stoicism as a method. Okay. Can I talk? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, sure. well, this next? is great. Thank you so much. All right, uh, Don. Um, let's move to the next so question. Next back, question is from uh, Zeno. There is uh, there is all the kinds of yes. Please go ahead. Grew up in. Um, would you say that he? Yeah. So would you think that uh, the Stoics? excessive attention to anger or maybe because the people that write about this are people that are pretty powerful uh, they are not slaves and if they are slaves they're high level slaves uh, in in the way that maybe anger is a emotion of the powerful uh, rather than anguish or anxiety uh, yeah, so that's, that's kind of my question. Well, not all of the Stoics were powerful. Uh, Cleanthes was famously very poor. He watered gardens for a living at night. Um, Socrates, like whom the, the, the Stoics are inspired by, was generally perceived as being poor and living in poverty, although he really was kind of lower middle class would be perhaps a better way of describing him. Epictetus was a freed slave who lived in poverty. Like, so it's not true that all of the Stoics were powerful. Um, and yet, as far as we're aware, they all seem to have shared this interest in anger. And actually, I would say, and I touched on this a little bit in the presentation, I think that relative 
the importance of anger. So rather than say the Stoics place too much importance on it, I think they are closer to the truth and that we probably neglect it too much. Like we would do well to learn from the Stoics and discuss anger more, especially look what's happening at the moment. Like in this, you know, it, we should be discussing anger more as a society. Psychologists should be doing more research on anger. Like our self-help literature should deal with anger more. Um, but it comes from other people, as I mentioned earlier, because anger is externalizing, people self-refer for anxiety, depression, they buy self-help books on anxiety and depression. And it's usually more driven by other people saying, you've got a problem with your anger, buddy. So we need to help other people maybe notice that anger is affecting their judgment and help them in a compassionate way to address that as a society, I feel. I think we can actually learn a lot from the Stoics in that regard. Uh, the next question is from Mike. Mike, go ahead. Hi. Oh, hi. Um, I really liked reading uh, Seneca's De Ira on uh, language, I mean, on anger. And he had all sorts of really uh, nice and sometimes funny examples. Do, do you recommend reading uh, Seneca's uh, De Ira on anger and uh, what does he get wrong? I, I know he mentions humors, I think, once ancient physiology, but what else do you think he gets wrong? Thanks. Well, actually, at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned on anger, the era, and uh, you know, I said, you know, this is our main source for understanding stoic theories of anger. But just kind of to be different, like I thought for a change, let's talk about what Marcus Aurelius says about anger. Maybe we didn't have time to do this today, but also it'd be interesting to compare the two because they say a lot of similar things, but there are also some differences in the things that they say. Um, I, I mean, honestly, like what I'd say about Seneca's on anger is that it's remarkably contemporary and relevant today. I mean, there are the things that are no longer relevant are things I think that are trivial and obvious. Like you mentioned the kind of, you know, ancient uh, theory of the humors, um, you know, some aspects of ancient morality about women and slaves and, and things like that obviously aren't relevant. But we these are all things we take for granted when we're reading ancient literature that we kind of bracket off. Um, because they, they don't translate into modern society. I mean, the, the model of anger that Seneca actually describes, he describes a, a three-stage model of anger, is pretty much the cognitive model. You know, I, the, one of the few things that I would say needs to be approached carefully, there are two things, actually, um, from a therapeutic point of view. So first of all, Seneca and the other Stoics don't understand and don't say enough about the possible negative consequences of imaginal exposure. So when he talks about premeditatio malorum, or the visual, visualizing exile and death and things like that, um, he, because he doesn't know about psychopathology, he doesn't know modern research and psychotherapy, he he, he's not aware that sometimes that could actually be harmful if it's approached in the wrong way. And specifically, he doesn't say, he's not aware of the issues relating to the duration of exposure. Again, I, can't, I, we, I, I don't have time to go into that in a lot of detail here. I discuss it in my books on the subject. But uh, you have to handle what we would call a marginal exposure carefully or it can actually make people worse um, and Seneca shows no awareness of that so this is something that if people are practicing stoicism based on the ancient stoics they do need to look at and the other thing they, the stoics kind of are aware of but they don't they could maybe have done a better job of addressing is the the risks of ruminative thinking so I find that when people are reading the ancient stoics they they may still be kind of ruminating and overthinking things and not really fully aware of the issues surrounding that, whereas there's a lot of contemporary research on that subject now. Next question is from Vincent. Vincent, go ahead. Hi, 
Hi, y'all. Thanks for putting this together. Uh, my question was, um, a lot of people I know are angry at politicians for being politicians and rich strangers for being rich strangers. And they are what they are, and I don't really know what else to say about that, but it's a very anti-useful thing, I think, to think that, and a lot of my friends think that. And I was wondering if there's anything I should do about that. That's it. Well, in terms of what we should do about things like that, the, the Stoics say, first of all, we have to change ourselves before we can change the world, right? So they thought, although we mainly, have, we're biased, right? And our understanding of Stoicism, because we, we just have books. Like the Stoics are all dead. Like we just have their books now, apart from people that try and live in accord with them today. But the ancients, right, the original Stoics, obviously they're all long dead. And now the, the paradox about that is they consistently tell us that the main way they learned Stoicism was by having the sharing the, the presence, the company of, of somebody who they thought was wiser and more virtuous. Um, Galen has a whole book about that just dedicated to the subject called On the Diagnosis and Cure of the Soul's Passions. So they thought role modeling was the best way to learn and that books were a kind of inferior version of this. Like, but sometimes it's all that we've got. Maybe, maybe we don't really have good role models around us and the most that we can do is kind of study the books and read about examples from previous generations and stuff. But they, so they would say, look, if you want to influence your friends, the first thing to do is influence yourself. Ancient literature is replete with examples of this kind of studied indifference towards political tyrants and corrupt politics. The Athenians had lots of corrupt politicians. They had mob justice. They had political tyrants. They had military dictatorships. Right. Challenge these. Socrates is a case study in how to challenge, a, to, to live through an oppressive military junta. Um, the Athenians were rounded up in 1,400 Athenians. Democrats and immigrants, uh, foreign residents of Athens, were rounded up by the Spartan junta and executed at the Stoa Poikile, um, where the Stoic school was founded like a couple of generations before Zeno founded the Stoic school. Um, and Socrates lived through that. And so he's a case study of how to challenge a corrupt political system, though he ended up being executed. Ironically, it wasn't by the oligarchs, by the, um, by the 30 tyrants. It was by the Democrats that got him in the end. Um, but he there's a lot of interesting stuff, in particular in Xenophon, about how Socrates managed to be a kind of outsider to the political system and kind of challenge it and question it at the same time, but also doing so mainly by, by modeling virtue. Next question is from Roger. Roger, go ahead. Hi, Don. Um, the internet signal is a little flaky here, so I just put my question in the chat. I'll just read it as well. So uh, clearly Marcus didn't have a teenage daughter <laughs> is my first reaction. So if you've had, I think you have a daughter as well. Um, so the, the real question is, do you have any recommendations for helping parents deal with anger that can arise when their children deliberately engage in disobedient behaviors? Right. The parents anger or the child's anger? Do you mean, you mean the parents anger? The, the parents anger. So dealing with it when they're deliberately trying to push your buttons. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Like, like Marcus actually did have teenage daughters, right? He had 14 kids. Yeah. Um, and they were, I was they were joking. mainly girls. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there are a bunch of famous references in classical philosophy to, to wayward sons and daughters. Um, still poor, the. Um, like the Megarian philosopher, who's one of the, the teachers of Zeno, one of the precursors of Stoicism, had a famously wayward teenage daughter. And uh, people came and said to him, your daughter's a nightmare, buddy. You know, they, they, she, she's atrocious. You're this famous teacher of, you know, a, a philosophy similar to Stoicism, and, and yet your daughter's notorious all over town. And uh, he famously had this kind of quip where he said, her actions on her, on her, 
Um, so he, the point of that, and this is a recurring motif in classical philosophy, um, that we don't have complete control over our kids. Right? And so you, you can't blame the parents entirely. They have some responsibility, but they, the Greeks and the Romans like to say that even Socrates had wayward sons. Right? So even the best parents sometimes turn out to have terrible kids. Right? This was a kind of cliche in ancient society. So I mean, maybe in some ways that can be helpful. You could view the whole of meditations uh, potentially as being relevant to coping with way troublesome wayward kids. I mean, I thought maybe you, you, you had this in mind, but I thought you were going to mention Commodus, right? He's like one of the most famously um, problematic kids, and actually as a teenager um, in, in Roman history. People always ask, how did Marcus like, deal with Commodus? And that quote that I read to you earlier, it's quite possible. It's not clear whether Marcus says, my son, let me give you this advice figuratively, or whether he literally means this is what he's planning to say to Commodus. That's possible. In that passage in the meditations, he might literally be showing us and describing to us how he plans to talk to his uh, teenage son, I guess, Commodus, at the time of writing, this would have been 14, approximately. Um, that's quite, so it's quite feasible. He's literally um, saying, this is how I plan to talk to him, not like a schoolmaster. And some of those anger management strategies that he's described might literally be ways of coping. You can just go through that whole list and think, could he be talking about Commodus here? Why, and then, you know, could this apply to a teenage son or a teenage daughter? I think the, the basic stoic strategy is just to keep reminding yourself that you know you don't control other people you're not responsible for other people you can only do the best that you can as a parent or a teacher and then you have to kind of in a way just kind of like stand back and watch what happens and accept like that it's not entirely under your control but also the stoics would say the main thing when teaching he notice he says they're not to lecture like a schoolmaster because he believes that the best way to teach his kids is through role modeling is through showing them and sometimes being a good role model with your kids might, it's, there's a kind of paradox to it. Like you want to lecture them and you want to get angry with them and you want to yell at them and because you feel that that's the right way to teach them. But ironically, the best way to teach them would be to show them that you're above that. And then they would learn from the fact that you're not yelling at them or lecturing them more than from your attempts to do so. There's a paradox or an irony, I think, to, to teaching kids, you know, what good behavior is. But meanwhile, we also have to accept that uh, even Socrates had wayward sons. Like, you know, we... You know, even the best parents sometimes have bad kids, and Marcus and Commodus. Thank so, you. So two weeks from now, we're going to do a meetup focused only on stoicism and parenting. So looking forward to that. Um, now, our next question is from Fati. Fati, go ahead. Hello. Uh, good day, everyone. Thanks for this great webinar. Actually, following Mr. Rogers' question, I would like to learn the stoic way of accepting and expressing our anger in a respectful way without harming others, especially those older people than us. I think, I mean, again, I'd come back to my previous answer and say, you know, all of the 10 strategies that we, I mean, but the whole webinar answers that question. Like, so we had a list of 10 strategies and all of them would be relevant to answering that question. Um, for the Stoics, the, and as I just said, the, the main thing in terms of communication would be role modeling. And often there's a paradox to communication, which would be showing that we're not reacting, showing that we're not angry, you know, sometimes doing nothing, not reacting and not responding communicates more. Um, it's what you don't do. Like, you know, the fact that you don't get angry might communicate a stronger message than anything. You could yell at somebody when you're in a fit of rage. So that that's part of it. And then also, as I, as I also mentioned earlier, we have a specific example in the meditations in Book 11, Chapter 18, where Marcus literally says, this is what I would say to somebody that I'm angry with. And he talks not only about what he would say, but how he would say it. And a big part of it is he communicates two of his favorite strategies, the same ones that he would apply to himself, like he teaches to the other person. So for stoicism, the anger is about hurting the other person, make, you know, making them worse in a way. Socrates said that when we desire revenge, we're desiring to make the other person worse. 
We're desiring to harm the other person and to harm the other person is to make them worse. So he said, that's crazy talk. Like, you know, what we should be doing is helping other people. That should be our motive to make them better and to turn enemies into friends. That was the doctrine that Socrates was known for. And the Stoics and Socrates believe the way to do that is by teaching people the values of Stoicism, but not in a preachy way, in a more subtle and nuanced way through role modeling and our own behavior. But ultimately it would be, it would be about uh, empowering and educating um, you know, other people. The Stoics believe we have to empathize with people, not be crass and blunt about it like the cynics were. We need to be tactful, but ultimately the way that we help other people is by uh, helping them uh, to realize that virtue is the only true good and that, uh, you know, anger does us more harm than the things that we're angry about and so on. Um, although first and foremost, they learn that from our example. Lisa, you're next. Lisa, go ahead. Okay, uh, next one is uh, Jonathan. Jonathan, go ahead. Yeah, uh, my question sort of is, uh, is um, the stoic, stoic orientation towards anger fundamentally different, any different than uh, the stoic orientation towards any emotion? Um, uh not really. Like in a sense, it's just a specific form of a much more basic general principle. Um, I mean, so anger is different from anxiety, and the Stoics say slightly different things about it. But for example, in that list of ten strategies, most of them would be relevant to other negative feeling. I mean, some of them would be relevant even to unhealthy or pathological desires. In fact, the Stoics think of anger as a desire. They have a slightly different, the Greeks have a slightly different um, way of mapping emotions, as I said earlier. For them, we would say anger is a, um, an emotion, but they actually think of anger more as a desire. It's a desire to harm somebody rather than a, 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 like what we would tend to think of as an emotion. But they, Certainly, most of the specific pieces of advice I just gave you would be relevant uh, to, to most other emotions. They're just kind of tweaked or adapted in their specificity a little bit more. Um, but a positive as well, sorry, just to clarify. So both negative and positive. Would, would the Stoics say the same things towards positive emotions, such as oh, joy, elation? Yep. No. Um, well, yes and no, because you ask the general question about positive emotion and then but I think you also have specific examples in mind so the Stoics have a whole category of positive emotion the, Sto the Stoics classify emotions into good bad and indifferent emotions right so the the negative unhealthy emotions like pathological anger but and then there's indifferent emotions the propathei which are the first movements the initial involuntary reflex like emotions which they think we share with other animals and we should accept and not struggle against um, and then there's the eupathei um, so they have this whole system of classification for healthy emotions which is part of what you're asking but the healthy emotions they have in mind might be different from the ones that you think and they so joy for example could be healthy or unhealthy it would depend so if it's irrational and excessive and unhealthy then it's a bad passion according to the stoics but if it's rational moderate and healthy then it's potentially a form of eupathia and a healthy uh, emotion and uh, part of the the dis thing that really distinguishes those is that the healthy emotions generally um place more value in our own character than upon external events and um, they are more consistent with reason and wisdom, moral wisdom, rather than kind of conflicting with it. Uh, they're more consistent in general, whereas the Stoics think that the irrational emotions are kind of contradictory. They think that the, the wise man or woman's thoughts and feelings form a more coherent whole. They have a consistent well thought through and coherent worldview so they talk a lot about this like they say the consistency and constancy of the stage this the, the sage um so there are things that kind of distinguish them and i would also say my, one of the controversial things that i like to say is that stoicism can be understood as a philosophy of love 
love is a kind of love is integral to stoicism and they see this kind of rational philosophical love as the centerpiece of our emotional life and kind of the basis of everything else but there are also what you might call negative emotions so epictetus in, in particular talks a lot about shame um, and, and again, this is it's difficult to translate what he says, but he, he refers to a kind of aversive feeling that he thinks is healthy and rational. And, but it's the aversion to vice. It's a kind of disgust or aversion towards oneself committing vice. And he thinks this is, this is good. It's a kind of discretion or a kind of reserve um, that the, the, the good person has. So there are kind of positive and negative healthy emotions that the Stoic uh, system encompasses. All right, so with that, uh, this brings us to the end of the Q&A. Uh, thank you very much, Don, really appreciate it. Now we're going to break out into a breakout room and we're going to discuss it in smaller groups of about uh, Don, you're welcome to stay if you want or leave, whatever you choose. Um, go ahead. Uh, well, but, thank you very much. I'll, I would give, love you, I'll, I'll give you the last word. I would love to stay, and it's been a pleasure being along, but unfortunately, I think I've, I've got other things I have to attend to, so I don't have the time to be around. But um, maybe some of you like be in touch with me afterwards. You can always just go to my website and email me or contact me on social media if you've got any questions. And it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me along. It's been a pleasure speaking to everybody and listening to your questions. And uh, I wish you good luck, fate permitting, with your uh, discussions. May they turn out well. And, you know, this is a very timely uh, uh, this today in particular of all days is you know a, a, absolutely a, a, an important day to be to be discussing the problem of anger. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Don.